Welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott M. Bernstein. Hey now, with along with my partner in crime, the doctor himself, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hello, and we're, we're back, man. We were in Los Angeles last week. Yeah, we were uh, attending to some business in La La Land. Jimmy and I were uh, helping out a, a new history uh, channel project uh, that's uh, fronted by Larry Fishburne, known as History's Greatest Mysteries. And uh, our episode that we helped out on related to Jimmy Hoffa uh, should be um, rolling out before the end of the year. So we're back in the Motor City. Now, now we're back in Motown, and uh, we got a very special guest for uh, our episode this week. He is a uh, decorated former G-Man uh, who was one of the uh, biggest undercover uh, FBI agents on the East Coast uh, during the uh, 2000s and, and 2010s. His name is Giovanni Rocco, and uh, he helped bring down the DeCalvicante crime family, which is the uh, mob in New Jersey that the, the, the Sopranos is based on. Um, and he went deep cover into the real life Sopranos for uh, at least three years, maybe even longer than that. We're going to get him to tell tell us uh, his story. And the the bust uh, came down in um, 2015 and brought down a, a, a capo regime in the DiCavalcante crime family. And I believe uh, in in his undercover work, he was run with some of the major, major players in that crime family and was getting exposed to uh, not just capos, but but bosses. And uh, John the Eagle, uh, Riggie, who is, uh, you know, a pretty legendary East Coast godfather, was around at this time. He's passed away since then, but I know he played a role in some of the drama that uh, Mr. Rocco was um, investigating in, in part of his infiltration. So thank you for joining us, Giovanni. You are, uh, we, are, we are honored, and it's a pleasure to have you. And it's a pleasure to be with you, and thanks for that strong intro, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so before we jump in, let's just tell everyone, and then we'll remind them at the end. Uh, you wrote a book called uh, Giovanni Ring, Giovanni's Ring, um, all about your life undercover and uh, your time infiltrating the New Jersey Mafia. Um, so you can buy that wherever books are sold. Uh, I got my hands on it right when it first came out and uh, really uh, just devoured it in, in a, probably about 72 hours, got through the whole thing. And um, me and a couple other mob nerds, <laughs> I remember being up late <laughs> one, one, one night, uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm online, and we're, we're kind of going back and forth with the, the tidbits that have come out of the book, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, looking for needles in the haystacks, you know, because sometimes uh, for, for the mob nerds, you know, some of the, the general information that books put forward is more for kind of the masses. But then when you, when you get the guys that really study it, we're combing through each page looking for little new uh, nuggets of information. And there were quite a few uh, great, great anecdotes and, and, and great insight in that book. So thanks for writing it and thanks for coming and, and, and sharing, uh, coming to the OG podcast and, and sharing with us uh, your experience, obviously, as an FBI agent and then your experience uh, authoring that book. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate you reading it and taking the time. I did write it with my co-author, Doug Schofield, and intentionally made it to be a fast read um, because if you have an attention span like me, I don't have enough time to sit there and read a long book, and I didn't want to make it a historical book, so it's just uh, pretty cut and dry about my life inside the, the Real Sopranos. That's why I got Giovanni's Ring, My Life Inside the Real Sopranos. Uh, it is the New Jersey Mafia based on a De Cavacantes, but it's also just the Sopranos and as a general Cosa Nostra as a whole. Yep. And some of these guys literally served as inspiration for some of the show. The Sopranos, obviously, the, the pioneering, grind, groundbreaking uh, mob show that HBO put out in 1999, last little 2007, uh, you know, changed television forever and uh, brought us the, the introduction of the anti-hero, um, really flipped the, the traditional TV show paradigm on its ear and uh, brought, you know, the quality of, of, of cinema um, to your cable box. And a lot of those characters, while not directly based on guys like uh, Vinny Ocean, uh, Joey Tinier, and, and Charlie the Hat, uh, John the Eagle, guys like that, they definitely served as 
uh, kind of fuel for David Chase's fire because David Chase grew up around the, the De Cavalcante uh, family. Not not the fact that he, he was in it or his family was in it, but he grew up in Newark and, and those guys were were uh, kind of running the city at that point. Now we have a movie that's coming out. Uh, this week actually premieres on October 1st, uh, The Many Saints in Newark, which is the, the prequel film to The Sopranos, which everyone's really excited about. So Sopranos is definitely... Uh, buzzworthy again. So, uh, Giovanni, I'm doing way too much talking here. Let's just dive <laughs> into to the story of you and just tell us uh, about, you know, uh, growing up and deciding to become uh, a member of law enforcement and then how that took you into undercover work. And then let's kind of lay the foundation for, for your, uh, y- your your big operations uh, that, that made you the star, uh, you know, star G-man that you became. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I guess it's a great caveat. You you were discussing the whole Sopranos versus the real Cosa Nostra, and I grew up in the '70s in New Jersey. Um, I'm born in you know early '70s, and I came up under those guys, and I'm familiar with them. So I think no matter which way, if you argue the case, who who the Sopranos based on, it's just Cosa Nostra in general. Um, it doesn't matter. Pick a mobster; they're all pretty much similar. They're not cookie cutter. Some are guys. Some guys are more ruthless than others. The guys that I was around, like Charlie the Hat. Um, he was ruthless. He was, you know, willing to do the ultimate deed, like so many older guys were that I I knew growing up or was around and exposed to. Uh, I didn't aspire to be a gangster. I didn't emulate them. I just had a lot of exposure due to the fact that I grew up in Bayonne, New Jersey. That's in Hudson County, right outside of Manhattan. Uh, and you had mentioned earlier about, um, you know, Hoffa being buried, and there's speculation that he's buried by, you know, in Jersey City under the Pulaski Skyway where we played and grew up and. You know, so there's so many ties to the real life mob uh, that I identified with it. I think that kind of added to the reason why I was able to do what I did and work my way into these guys without wanting to aspire to be a gangster. Uh, I'm third generation. Uh, my grandfather, I'm fourth generation first responder, but my grandfather, my uncles, brothers, you know, a lot of family married into me and uh, they became police officers as well. So I had a lot of law enforcement on one side. On the other side of my family, I had blue collar guys. Um, that just worked on the docks or worked in companies were truck drivers. And I had exposure through, through that way as well. Old school Brooklyn guys. I was around when my uncle was a truck driver and I went to work with him, not knowing which way my life was going to go. I was the black sheep of the family. I never aspired to, I always wanted to be a policeman, but because I was in so much trouble as a kid, I didn't think I'd ever make it there. My family begged me to change my evil ways. I was running in the street and I was doing stupid things. Um, and they kind of assumed that I'd be dead or in jail by 25. And it was a, I, I knew the exact moment I wanted to be a cop, and I wrote about it in the book. Uh, I watched my father make a collar on the way home from watching the movie in Jersey City, and he saw a guy that was wanted and pulled over to the police car and you know took it down. He was an armed robber. And uh, I knew by watching him do that, and that's what I aspired. I always, good versus evil, I always took the good guy's side. Cowboys and Indians, I picked the, you know, I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted to be a hero. So, um I guess in, in my senior year of high school, uh, I had no direction in my life. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was fortunate. I cut out of school one day and I took a, a test to become a, a New Jersey Bell phone repairman. That even exposed me to more guys in the mob world because the area that I worked were all gangsters. It's the old school guys uh, that had social clubs and I climbed the pole and I write about it in a book where, you know, it seems like everything lined me up to do this work. I, I would climb a pole to fix something. The guys who come out of the social club, they didn't know whether I was law enforcement or whether I was working for New Jersey Bell or Ma Bell. And I was, you know, maybe putting a tap on their lines or a camera on the pole. So they literally called me down. So I was interacting with these guys on a regular basis. Um, and just growing up, you know, I, my father was a well-respected cop. And, uh, you know, he tried to steer me clear of the streets. Um, he would show me photographs of homicide scenes, suicides, uh, body parts that floated up in the Newark Bay or the Hudson River or someplace where he was working and he had a, a homicide and he'd bring, he'd bring the autopsy photos home just to show us. And I think he did it to harden us a little bit. And that even played a part in what I did later. Because again, to play a, a hard street guy, you know, these guys could smell it. They're like dogs. They smell it. They're like a bunch of pit bulls. And if they smell fear or they smell, they smell any pause in you, they will blow up. Because of the exposure I had, my father raised us hard and fast. Um, that all played a part in it as well. So early in my career, I, I took a, uh, a liking to narcotics work, and I, I made my way through narcotics very quick. I got my gold shield. I was aggressive in the street with my partners, 
And uh, I got a chance to, from narcotics, I was called in early to do some undercover work and given a chance. And I ran with that. And that was my love. Uh, I think back and, you know, I listen to Jack Garcia and I share an affinity with him for the, um, the old 70s movies, uh, you know, and the old cop movies that we used to watch. And the thing was when I watched uh, Reservoir Dogs, that's when I knew I was going to be an undercover. I watched a scene in Reservoir Dogs where the guy was an undercover cop. And I knew that was my passion. I could feel that fire burning in my stomach. So I knew that's what I wanted to do with my career. So I went, I went headfirst into it. Every chance I got, I, I never said no to an operation. As crazy as it was, or as insane as it might have been, I put myself in situations, I thrived on it. That was my, my adrenaline was my drug. That was the thing that I chased. I became an, an adrenaline junkie. So anytime I kicked in the door, I wanted to be the first one in the door. I was young. I didn't have kids. I didn't want any of my partners to get shot. And I always wanted to be the first guy through the door. God forbid something happened. So I lived my life that way. Um, and then when I got into undercover work, I lived what I learned in the street. I didn't have any official training and I was doing some crazy stuff with the DEA and I wound up being asked to join a task force there. I did the DEA for a few years. I had a couple of kids. I got married and divorced. Um, you know, cost my, because my, my relationship uh, with the job and my relationship with my true family, I was too young to balance the mental health of it and the processing of what I was doing. Uh, you do get a little bit of Hollywood. And everybody tells you you're good at what you do and it kind of boosts your ego up a little bit and you, you start believing in nonsense. So uh, I took a step back a little bit and then I had the opportunity. FBI came calling and I, I went to their training and I did some training with them and it was a very difficult school I went to and I, I did well in that school and I graduated. And then from that point on, that's when I learned what undercover work was really about. The psychological part of it, the mental end of it, the mind games, how to read people the right way, how to understand, how to communicate effectively, how to deescalate something. It changed my world and opened up this I was able to do international cases at that point. I could work, um, you know, without saying spy cases or anything. When, when anything that came my way, I can do it as a street guy, you know, and my persona was and a kid from New York, New Jersey, an Italian kid. You can't wash that stink off of me. It's in me. It's on me. And when I went into situations, whether it was cartels, whether it was uh, Russian mob guys or whoever it was, they all believed who I was because I wasn't trying to portray somebody. I was just being that kid that if I didn't become a cop, I would have been a street guy and I would have made a damn good street guy. And that's what I portrayed myself to be. And I never changed that. So uh, because of that, I was able to work my way into different cases. People would call me into their case if they need bona fides. And that's how I, I built the reputation in the undercover community with the Bureau. Didn't, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, your book, wasn't your persona, uh, your undercover persona was uh, uh, related to, to the biker world? It was. Yeah. So early on, you know, a lot of my uncles were into bikers and uh, had ties into a couple of different street gangs and uh, spinoffs of other OMGs, outlaw motorcycle gangs like the, the big, the big. Sh uh, um, they were like little sister clubs that my uncles were in. And uh, because of my relationship with my father when I was younger, we didn't really care for each other that much. Um, he didn't have too much love. I didn't have too much love for him until later in our lives. Uh, so anything I can do to go against my father and anything I can do to go against authority when I was younger and what better way than to go the way of a biker. So any chance I got, I bought a motorcycle. I started riding young. I got into Harley Davidson's. I was, I really wanted to ride around with my uncles and, and work on tow trucks, work on cars and just be, I wanted to live that persona just to rub my father the wrong way in a kind of a way. And I got sucked into it a little bit. And explain to the, explain to the listeners how, and we've, we've talked about it uh, at times uh, throughout our uh, podcasting career, but there there is a kind of a natural nexus between outlaw motorcycle gangs and the Italian mafia. Now, they seem like they're completely opposite sides of the criminal spectrum, but they actually have a symbiotic relationship in a lot of cities, um, both – uh, within America and and even in you know in Canada and other parts of um, Europe, uh, where you have Italian mobsters working you know in very close uh, business relationships with bikers, can you kind of illuminate some of that? Sure, I grew up watching that. I grew up seeing it, and I also saw it after I came on a job. Um, I was probably exposed to stuff that I shouldn't have been exposed to on the job, but as a young kid, I saw it. The guys in my neighborhood were the old school gangsters. Before John Gotti was John Gotti and before he became the Teflon Don, in my neighborhood, there was a guy, uh, John DeGilio. Yep. And Johnny DeGilio was fighting a case back then. 
and he was a Bayonne guy. He ran the docks and he was a heavy, he was a pretty heavy hitter. And, uh, he was the guy who fought the government first. And really he got, he went up for trial and he fought it. And eventually his own guys whacked him out. And it was actually a Bayonne cop, a retired Bayonne cop that whacked him out. And, you know, was a member of his crew. But I watched those guys. I watched them interact because my uncle knew people and because I was exposed through him. And then I watched things that the cops were doing because, again, I, I grew up as a cop's kid. So I was exposed to both sides of the fence. My father would have something or I would see these guys interact or go in a bar with somebody. I'd watch these guys interact. And it was a big, strong. And I grew up knowing that the bikers collected for guys, mm-hmm. and especially in my neighborhood in Hudson County. Those guys were the ones. Sometimes they would put money in the street for the mob. The mob would give them money. And these biker guys who didn't have two nickels to rub together, they were putting money in the street on behalf of the mob. Or the mob put the money in the street. They didn't want to collect themselves because they knew if they, you know, they got caught, they'd take a pinch for it. So they get these outlaw bikers to do it. Uh, and I saw it after I came on the job. I was working uh, construction on the side for years when I was in narcotics and a young cop. And one of my good friends who I was working with, I didn't know, he wound up taking a loan from a guy. And he wound up in a jam because these bikers came to collect and they were so-called, quote, friends of his and guys that he knew. And it turned out he went to the mob and took a loan from the mob and he did, he got a knock at his door and here were these outlaws. These outlaws were there to collect. Yep. So, um, you know, I saw it in many different occasions. I saw it. And it still works that way today. It does. Nothing and, changed. And in New Jersey right now, they have a, a kind of all hands, you know, we're, we're digressing a little bit, but uh, in New Jersey right now, they have, an, a, in terms of law enforcement, and I'm sure you know this, there's a kind of an all hands on deck mentality for what's been going on with the pagans, um, the big motorcycle gang uh, in the Southeast. And uh, since this guy by the name of uh, Conan the Barbarian, Richter, took over the family yeah. uh, or took mm-hmm. over the, the organization, he's been um, championing this expansion effort where he's spreading uh, the Pagan's brand not just up and down the East Coast, but he's going west and into the Pacific Northwest. It's very um, – it's a, it's, it's a very uh, real-time – um, power move by by Richter, who's actually on his way to prison now, um, and has mm-hmm. named a named a temporary successor. But uh, I just wrote something recently about how he put a he put a pagans chapter in uh, Washington State. There was never been pagans right. out in the Pacific Northwest. He's got uh, he had, he yeah. put he put chapters in Oregon, Washington, Oklahoma, Nevada, Texas, Arizona. So. Mm-hmm. And and the pagans sure. work very closely with the Italians, so I know that was a quick digression. Very close. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's okay. That's a great. It's a great uh, explanation because do you know it as a chapter of the pagans in Elizabeth, New Jersey? They had a headquarters for years. Yep. They've had a headquarters down there. Yep. And they do. They're used by the mob. They're you know they're they work closely together. They're aligned. Yeah. Yeah. They're very much aligned. The ones that I know, the pagans uh, are aligned with. Uh, you know, the Joey Merlino crew uh, in Philadelphia, the, yes. the Philly, mm-hmm. uh, North Jersey LCN. Right. And I, I knew both sides. I knew the outlaws and I knew the gang guys. Um, so that's the persona that I took because, again, it is my true life. I was around some guys that were hooked up in both sides of the defense. Uh, so I understood both both ends of it. As a young cop, I still had when I I even remember going on the job so much so that the outlaw bikers I knew through my uncle, we were in a tow yard. The day before I went to the police academy and they said their goodbyes to me and actually asked me, you're really going to, and I'm not going to tell you what club they're with, but it's, you know, very close to the ones you mentioned. And there's always been a turf war. And these guys ask me, you're really going to do this? You want to be a cop? You're going to go that way? You're going to go to that side of the fence? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I made my decision. That's what I'm going to do. And they made it very, okay, so from this point on, you understand you're on the other side. So, you know, there's not going to be any, you know, shucking and driving anymore with us. There's not going to be any interaction. Like, this is it. And we literally had cans of beer and we toasted each other and cheers and wished each other good luck. And then I went my merry way. You know, I bumped into them over the years and they knew when they crossed my path, if I had to collar them up, I did. And on occasions I did. So I understood both sides of it. But early in my undercover career, that's the persona that I took. I was an outlaw biker because it was the first long term undercover I ever did. In the early 90s, I had infiltrated some associates that were high level associates to a particular club in the New York area. And I never made my way in. There was a guy actually at the time, there was a guy into the club that you mentioned, the Pagans. And he was another street cop from a different department. And back then we didn't do task forces. You weren't loaned out. You stayed in your area of responsibility. You didn't leave your city. 
you know, because your badge said you worked in whatever city you were in. Um, and then he and I infiltrated at the same time. It was a little bit deeper into where he was and I was making my way in. And that was the first long term. I think that was about three to four months at the time. And that's how I got noticed by the DEA. And from there it was, you know, come on board with us. And I started working on the cover with them and I grew my beard long and I had the braids in my, my, my beard. I had the hair down in my ass and I had the earrings in my, you know, and I took on a persona for a number of years. So much so when I was with the DEA uh, in my first marriage and I lived in Bergen County, New Jersey, my neighbors actually reported me to the DEA for being an outlaw biker and a drug trafficker. So, you know, it was good that they believed it. You were living it. But it was kind of like, you know. I was living it, you know, and it does poison your brain. It really does. Because on the one hand, you start to, you start to buy into that. Not that you're going to, they're, they're never going to corrupt me and pick my side, but the cops start to look at you different. And that takes its toll on you too as an undercover. You know, they, um, they come at you each way. And it's fun. To, I mean, it, there's some just human nature aspects of it. I mean, sometimes it's fun to be a, a bad guy and I, I'm sure you can get oh, kind of, yeah. it, um, uh, it's intoxicating. It's alluring. It's something that seduces you. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. And the deeper you go, the guys that don't understand that are FBI agents or DEA or, or just cops in general, they start to distance themselves from you because then they start to make snide remarks. You know, here you are doing a bang up job and, and you bleed blue just like them. But then they start to say, Hey, your friends, your friends want to go to a long dinner tonight. Uh, what, what are you doing? Why'd you take so long at the meeting? You hanging out with your buddies. These people aren't my friends. But you understand, like you, you're getting it. You, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole sometimes for these guys. If you don't have the training that I, at least, Earl, I saw both sides. Are early in my career, it was all self-taught, and I made a lot of bad mistakes. I got myself almost killed a few different times. Um, but it wasn't until I was more mature and had that training, and then I looked at it from a m more mature standpoint of an undercover and what an undercover should be, and looked at it from that mental game. Uh, it's a game changer. You know, it's like being in the minors versus the majors. So. It makes sense the, that law enforcement would um, exploit this natural relationship between the bikers and the um, Italian mafia because not only in Giovanni's case, but I know with um, Jay Dobbins, like, the, and he was ATF. He he convinced the Hells Angels that he was a biker but a collector for the Italians, and they bought it. Like, because that just makes like yeah. that's not unheard of, right? That's like that's a something no. that that is no. common. So mm -hmm. they they bought it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And me, I was fortunate. Then I learned again, I infiltrated bikers. I infiltrated Russian. I infiltrated Asian organized crime. I infiltrated the Black Panthers. All is Giovanni Gatto. You know, I never, I never went into my closet and changed it to my biker clothes and put my cut on or, you know, put my fake tattoos or my hair. You know, I never did that. I, everything I did later in my career was always as the guy I am right now talking to you. This is who I was. And I was able to go into all of these different organizations and they all bought into it, you know, because everybody believes a, a mobster is who he is. But I never claimed to be in a mob. I just let them make the assumption that I'm a mobster. You know, you, you, you turn it up. Sometimes you have to turn it down to a two. It's, it's just like the volume on a radio. Either I could turn it down to a two or I could turn it up to a 12. Now, if I go too far, the bad guys or the targets, they might think that I'm a stone cold killer and they could actually be afraid of me. I've had that happen with subjects. And you don't want that in the court. You don't want to play those tapes where, you know, so you've got to dial it back a great distance. You know, I've had guys and girls say to me, you, you kill a lot of people. You, you've done a lot of bad things. No, no. I, well, why would you even think that, you know? So then you realize they're the criminals. I can't make them think that I'm more, more of a criminal than me. So, um, but having that organized crime versus biker thing, I was able to use that. That's in my real life. And I used it in my, my cases. So the Russian mobsters you were dealing with, and street gangs that you were investigating, they all were under the impression that you were either an associate or a member of Cosa Nostra. That's the impression they were under. Correct, yeah. Just an Italian guy from the neighborhood. I, I lost the persona of being an outlaw biker when I realized that the government was going to pay for my high-end five-star restaurants and I could stay in high-end <laughs> hotels instead of sleeping on the ground <laughs> under my bike. Then I really quickly realized <laughs> you know what? I like this persona a lot better than, than some piece of trash and the turd that's sleeping on the ground under his bike because he's trying to stay warm. Yeah, well, so I quickly well stated. Right. Well, Giovanni, so did, did your infiltration of the De Calvacantes, which I believe started through a guy, a street guy by the name of Jimmy Smalls, did, did, it, be yeah. did it begin in your 
uh, Giovanni Gatto role, and then you transition from that the further up you got you know, uh, up the criminal chain in, in the De Cavacantes or, you know, how did that evolve? Yeah, that's just uh, the Jimmy Smalls. I was introduced to him because I was born a fetus. I was brought in, like I said, because I had this stink on me. So I was asked to come down as bona fides to a, uh, a narcotics deal that somebody was doing, another agent. And uh, I was just backing him up on a deal in Atlantic City. And I showed up on a Saturday or Sunday night and it was late and I needed to be home. And I was really super ticked off that this guy was running late, you know, and I was tired of getting uh, tired of sitting around waiting. I had already ate dinner. I'm watching the Yankee game, you know, past time. I got a, you know, I got a, a long ride home from Atlantic city to get back to North Jersey. Uh, I'm getting ticked off. And when this guy, Jimmy Smalls actually showed up with four other guys or three other guys, I was my genuine pissed off self. And, uh, he took it and ran with it. You know, he thought we were gangsters. He came up with this whole persona that we were. He actually went back into the neighborhood and said that he had met Bruno Scarfo guys and that we were connected guys from Philly. He made this whole thing up in his head because he actually thought we were mobbed up guys. Never told him that we were, never indicated it. But I guess just because of what I said before, I had it turned up a little too high and he bit. Um, so. No big deal. At that time, I didn't care. You know, this wasn't an organized crime case. This is just a drug case that I'm going to put this guy to bed quick. We'll get him past the threshold and, and we'll put him to bed. Um, you know, he was a career criminal, so it wouldn't take much to do that. And uh, not realizing that that case would spin into uh, meeting other people and then eventually becoming what was the Charlie horse and meeting Charlie Stango and then, and then infiltrating into the Cavacantes. You know, it's interesting, Scott, we've talked about this before, but what... Uh... Giovanni's talking about is um, they're they're actually doing the work for law enforcement because what you and I have talked about that in other organized crime groups, whether it's Irish gangs, African American, Russian, whatever bikers, there's real currency to being affiliated with Italian with an Italian mob guy. Yeah. So like they did the work for it's the him. Gold, it's the gold standard, right? Because they that's what they wanted to believe. Right. They wanted he wanted they want to think they're doing yeah. business with Sonny Corleone, <laughs> right? So or Tony McCann, right? So he's going around telling people that even though Giovanni didn't even say that, but like it's like like. I'm running with made guys, yeah. connected guys. Connected there's, guys there's, made guys. Right, there's currency to that. Would you say that that was part of it, Giovanni? Like the the, the currency in, in the underworld, that if you're running with the Italians, that that's still you know sort of the gold standard? Sure. Yeah, it, it absolutely was so much so that, you know, and I let it ride. We decided just let it go. Let him believe what he wants. If he wants to believe him, you know, if he wants to believe him, Tony Soprano, let him believe I'm Tony Soprano. <laughs> but it came back to bite me on the hand. That was the first time something came back to bite me on the hand because as the case went on, I had to answer for that. That came back to bite me in a bad way because when I was around the real guys, they wanted to know who I was. They wanted to know because they, they heard that I was connected. Now I had to play stupid, connected to what? What are you talking about? Connect, like connect four? What are you talking about? Like I really had to dumb it down. You know, what are you talking about connected? I don't know. Well, you're with anybody. You're connected. You're with, who, who's, who represents you? We're talking about it. I represent myself. So I really had to be that lone wolf biker guy, a, a well-dressed one. We talk about it. I have no idea what you're referring to. I have no idea what you're speaking. And I made them explain it to me. And then that's when I, I explained it away. No, I ain't Bruno Scoffo. What are you talking about? Nobody ever said that. You ever hear that out of my mouth? Did I ever say that to you? Why would you say that? You know, and I had to play stupid. And, you know, you had to answer that because now... What if there was a war? What if, you know, what if there was a problem between the two families and then you got involved in that? So I had to be very careful in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it puts you in a precarious position, but it sounds like you were able to, yeah. to cover that because you, you never actually told that dude you were connected. So in that way, you know, that you, you, it sounds like you were able to explain your way out of that because you never said that in the first place. I was because it was, it, yeah, it came up when I was introduced to Louis, uh, Luigi Oliveri. That's the first time it came up. How does Jimmy Smalls get you to a, at that time, a, an up and coming De Calvacante uh, soldier who eventually becomes a capo, I believe, uh, Luigi, Louis the Dog, mm -hmm. Oliveri, who was very close to John Riggi, right? Right. So I'm dealing with Jimmy for a long time. Uh, we know Jimmy's related to a guy, Charlie Stango. Charlie Stango's in prison. He's in prison for murder at the time, and he's about to be paroled. No big deal. Jimmy has no respect in organized crime. And look, in, in Costa Nostra, he's nobody. He's a street kid from Elizabeth, New Jersey, who has ties to everybody and their mother. He's got ties to the, the street gangs, the, the Bloods, or whoever, Crips. I mean, the kid's all over the map. Um, but he is blood of Charlie Stango. 
And uh, so he goes back and telling the neighborhood and telling Louie. And then Louie comes knocking on the door. And basically, when everybody starts to see that this kid Jimmy is making money and he's doing work with this guy Giovanni, of course, any mob guy wants to know, well, how the hell are you making money? You, you know, you, you couldn't make money at a lemonade stand. What are you doing? How are you making money? You know? And then he had to say, well, this guy, and then all of a sudden, you know, it, it happened that Louie wanted to meet us. And then that happened. And then after Louie met us, he had a lot of questions and I dodged those questions fine. And we, and then before you know it, Luigi was really good with his money. And again, like any businessman, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy tried taking some shots at us and he tried beating me. He gave me some bad product in the street and I was able to give it back as I explained in the book. Uh, one of the supervisors in the bureau really stepped up and after a few lab results and we realized there was no controlled dangerous stuff in the stuff that he sold us. He, he was a street kid. He tried to take a shot at us. And that's when I explained to him, are you crazy? You know, are you out of your mind? You know who I'm giving this stuff to? And then I kind of alluded to the fact that I was selling my stuff that I was buying from him from outlaw bikers. I said, listen, I'm not worried about it because these guys, they're not going to kill me. Right. They're not going to come after me. They're not going to kick my they're going to want to know who took a shot at me and gave me this. And Jimmy, I don't want to give up your name. You know, you got to make it right. So because I played it that way and the Bureau let me, we really had some real bona fides in the street. And I guess a year had gone by and I was banging around with Jimmy and, and then Louis was buying stuff from me. Louis was always good with his money. We never had any issues. Uh, and then the Bureau, you know, the Bureau started deciding, well, continue on with Jimmy. Now nah, put Jimmy on the back burner, deal with Louis. You know, okay, we're going to deal with Louie now. Louie's the main, you know, okay, so we'll focus on Louie. Giovanni, w one thing that uh, that I noticed when your book came out, mm -hmm. and we had heard uh, Louie's name um, when when the bus hit, but right. both Louie and, frankly, Charlie were not guys that, at least for the public— they really weren't on anyone's radar the way that uh, Tinier Scalfani or uh, jo John Riggi or, um, you know, uh, Jimmy Dumps Palermo, guys like that right. that had been kind of staples or known, uh, you know, known players in the DiCalvacante family. So it, it seemed like – and, and obviously, and we've said this before on the show – you know, the mob doesn't put out press releases, doesn't do press conferences mm -hmm. when you know new guys are, are coming up through the ranks and getting promotions and whatnot. But right. were, was the Bureau in New Jersey aware of Louis Oliveri's status and then eventually uh, Charlie the Hat status um, before you started getting intelligence on them? We did. We had a lot of intelligence on the family over the years. Um, throughout the 90s and the 2000s, my supervisor in the Bureau, Anthony Zamponia, uh, and again, the stars all, always allow, they, they aligned for me in this case. It was crazy how these things happened. Anthony Zamponia wound up getting transferred from New York into the Jersey division, and he had a history of working all the families when they were at the peak over in New York, and he worked the D. Cavacantes. Okay. And he knew of Charlie. He knew of, you know, San the Plumber. He knew Vinnie Oceans. He worked all those cases. He knew of the unsolved homicides and all the open cases that, that the Bureau had been looking at and still do. Um, so Charlie Stangle was a gangster's gangster and always has been. He's been on the radar for a long time. And it was because he was off the radar because him and Ray Tango, yeah. these guys, are, I mean, him and Ray Tango were like, you know, a, I don't know. I, there's went, rumors that, that that movie Tango and Cash, yeah. they were like, you know, they were like that, you know, Charlie and Ray Tango. And like wasn't, that. wasn't um, Charlie was serving a pretty long prison sentence before you were encountering him, right? Charlie was serving a prison sentence for the murder of Billy Mann in 1981. Right. He so, brought Billy, him and a couple other guys brought him to a meeting at the Sheridan. They whacked him out there in the interim of killing Billy. They wound up shooting one of the guys in the car with them, with Charlie. And he caught a round, I think, in the shoulder. They dumped the car. Um, you know, they left Billy, Billy Mann was dead in the street in the back of the Sheridan on Seacaucus, I think it was. And, um, they left him dead. They crushed the car. They didn't get rid of the car in time. They recovered the car. Uh, Pino, the guy that got shot, he went to the hospital to get treated and then he, he flipped. And then Charlie was actually doing time. He went on a lamb for a year. Charlie was on a run for a year and they were looking at him for some other cases that they were trying to put on him. 
And then uh, he went on a lamb, and then he actually tried to whack out Pino for, for turning state's evidence against him. So he caught the murder rap, and then he caught the conspiracy to commit murder. So he was doing time for that. Talk about meeting him and getting introduced to him. Yeah, that was crazy. So uh, when that came, Jimmy said to me, listen, my, you know, by that time, I was putting Jimmy on a back burner, and um, I started dealing more with Louie because that's what they wanted. Uh, and, you know, I always did what the Bureau told me to, no matter what. And, you know, uh, I took the case where they wanted me to take it. And they wanted me to focus on Louie. In doing so, Jimmy got jealous and wanted to one-up Louie. So he came to me one day and he says, listen, I know you're doing making money with Louie, but, you know, you should be with me making money because my uncle is a captain. He, or No, I'm sorry. My uncle was a soldier. He says he's getting out. He's a May guy. And again, I made him explain what he's talking about, you know. He's, he's going to be a captain when he gets out. I said, your uncle's a cop? They're like playing stupid. What do you mean, your uncle's a cop? He goes, no, my uncle's in the mob. He's with the DCAS. He might explain the whole thing. So he did it to win me over. And then he wanted me to meet his uncle. His uncle, of course, had gotten out. And the Bureau, we knew, actually, you know, the Bureau knew of the day Charlie was getting made to Capo. He got out of prison as a soldier. And then he was brought to a hotel in New Jersey and he was made a captain at the ceremony when he got out of prison because he served his time. Riggy bumped him up? Yeah, Riggy, bumped, Riggy was the one who sanctioned it because anything at that time, Riggy was out of jail for his RICO and murder charges. He was older, though. He was, he was looking to pass the torch at that time. Right. So Charlie Biggers, Mujera had a part in it and a couple other guys, and his consular had a part, and then his street boys. Okay. So uh, at the time, Riggy was still calling the shots. And... You know, Charlie got out of prison, realized, you know, like any gangster, how am I going to make money? Finds out that his nephew is, is doing pretty well. And I guess he, his nephew asked him, and he, no, I want no interest in meeting anybody. I'm out. I'm fresh out of prison. But then as he hears, I guess he had reached out to the Gambino guys and asked the Gambino guys to look into us. And then, you know, again, it's all explained in the book. You know, they looked into me and they checked me out on behalf of Charlie. I got called to a meeting and answers to one of Charlie's associates. So he vetted me first. And then eventually when Charlie was comfortable, he said to Jimmy, okay, you and your friend come and see me. We went to the Union Plaza Diner. I met this guy. And, you know, again, I, I've never, it's very few people in this world that walk this earth that intimidate me or I, you know, my heart starts to flutter. But when you look into those, he has ice cold blue eyes, crystal blue eyes. And, you know, he couldn't be more of a gangster in the persona that I knew up, you know, the old school street guys. That's what he was. Did Riggy like him? Sure. Well, Charlie came up under Jojo Ferrara. Oh, he came up who under was Jojo very, Ferrara. Yeah, he came up under Jojo. Jojo was, was, and I know this because Charlie shared this with me over the year. Um, he came up under Jojo Ferrara. And there was a lot of things they did. And he was a go-to guy. When Riggy needed stuff done, Charlie was the guy. You know, Charlie always reminded me, Giovanni, I kill more people by accident. <laughs> you know, I kill more people by mistake. Don't worry about it. He was a, you know, he, he was a self-proclaimed killing machine and he didn't care. You know, he didn't, and he had a reputation for it and he was used, he's known across the country. I knew, you know, Midwest guys knew him out on the East coast, on the West coast. He knew him all over up in Canada. He had connections all over because he's a gangster's gangster, yeah. you know, and he's a true gangster in the sense that he wasn't in the Vinny ocean that wanted to come up and shine and be in the spotlight like the John Gotti's and be the Hollywood legends. They, they weren't those guys. The real gangsters are the guys that stay on their radar. And you're, refer, you're referring to Vincent Palermo, a.k.a. Vinny Ocean, who was a nephew Vinny to Ocean's, yeah. Sam DiCalvacante, who was the, the namesake of the family. And uh, he was a nephew by marriage, I think. I think he married DiCalvacante's niece or granddaughter. Correct. Uh, and mm -hmm. Vinny, he married o in. Vinny Ocean became an acting boss in the late 90s and eventually flipped. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people, and I'm interested in your take on this, uh, there's a lot of people that think that he was kind of the main archetype uh, inspiration for Tony Soprano because he was around the same age. Strip he, club. he lived in the suburbs. He had a strip club that he uh, yeah. had ordered out of, uh, had kind of a family in the suburbs while running the New Jersey Mafia. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think of Vinny and, you know, the time with him, uh, you know, not with him, but I, I know all the background of him. But I don't see him being the inspiration for Tony Soprano. There's so many other guys. I don't I've never once thought, oh, yeah, right. I get it. I don't look at Tony Soprano and look at Vinny Oceans. You right. Know? The strip club is there. There is a strip club. The meat markets, the, the Satrials is, you know, there's a real life place and there's 
all of those things exist. Vinny Oceans didn't bring that to the table. The strip clubs have been there since John Briggy, you know, was a young guy coming up in this. Uh, Frank Frost was the acting boss when Riggy first went into prison. And Frank Garacci is how Louie maintained his status. Louie was a driver for Frank Garacci while he was the acting boss, while Riggy was being held down in prison. Right. And, now, and that's why when Luigi... That? No, go ahead. I was going to just add some color that both um, Garacci and Riggy have died in the last five, six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Riggy was old. He wanted to pass the torch. He was getting out of it. His son, Manny Riggy, was Louis' captain at the time. And that's how Louis had gotten his button. Louis wasn't a made guy. Louis was a, just an associate like me when I met him. And then because he would kind of show up every day, meet the old man, come to the house, hang out with his captain and, and the boss, Man, you know, Manny Riggy and John Riggy. And then eventually, and I know this through Charlie, you know, eventually Manny Riggy said to John Riggy, his father, like, listen, pop, before you go, before you pass the torch, you should make this kid Louie. He's honest. He's with us his whole life. He grew up in this. And, this. and what happened was rumor has it that Riggy feeling he got more juice. He was respected by the five families because of all the juice that he had. He make his own rules. He doesn't have to follow close to those rules. Yeah, you know what? I'll bring I'll make him right now. Bring him in here. Bring him in the bedroom. And he brought him in, and he broke all those rules. There's, there's, there's protocol for when a guy gets made that they have to go, and they have to go to all the different borgatas with a piece of paper, and they want to make this guy, and they want to make Dr. Jim. They want to make Scott. They want to make Giovanni. And somebody, you're usually a career or somebody who represents you a borgata will go to the other borgatas to make sure nobody on that list is having a problem with anybody. And maybe they'll go and maybe one of the other Borgatas will say, yeah, you know what? The guy Giovanni, we had a little bit of an issue a couple of years back. All right, we're not going to make him right now. It's just like corporate America. So we're not going to promote you right now. We're going to wait another six months and see if you come back clean and then we'll make you then. But with Louie, there was none of that. John Riggy thought he waves, the, he waves the flag. I make the rules. Bring him in here. You want to be made? Bip, bip, you, there you go. You're a made guy. You're a soldier. And because of that, guys like Big Ears Mujera, whose father was at the Appalachian meetings, who, if you remember, Vinny Oceans did battle with Big Ears Mujera, and they were going to kill each other. Mm -hmm. You remember uh, the story about Vinny Oceans put a hit on Charlie. So Charlie Mujera, he was the likely candidate to step in and take the torch and take the throne from John Riddy. So this is what I had walked into, not knowing all this was going to go on when I came in. A lot of politics. And I know, you know, then, yeah, a lot of politics. And then you got, I'm with the... the I'm with the biggest lunatic in the family, the biggest murdering machine, Charlie Stango, who they call him the hat because he used to say to me, you know what I call me? It's like that, that movie with the, the guy from Rocky. You turn the hat on backwards and that was it. That was my switch. Or if I took my hat off, somebody was going to die. That's the things he used to say to me. That's why I call him Charlie the hat. So that's the guy I was with. So when these, when these two sides of the family, there was a divide. And Louie and his guys were on one side and whoever, whatever bosses. And then there came an event that Louie embarrassed somebody. And it was Tinia that he embarrassed at a Christmas party. And then that was decided that the administration didn't want him around anymore. They wanted to uh, boot Louie the, the dog? Yeah. They decided, you know, I was already in by then. Um, so Louie, Louie took a liking to me because we were making good money together. And I had gone down to his his social club. I had been to the the Ribera Club, but I was smart enough never to go inside. I didn't want to pin myself down, so I stayed out of the club. And and then when Charlie came around, uh, the Bureau then turned around and says, you know what, put Louie on the other back burner of the stove and let's go after Charlie. So now I'm, I'm what? I'm going to blow off Jimmy, who is now, luckily for me, Jimmy went into prison on another unrelated charges. Um, but the problem was he got out really quick and people started suspecting he might have been a rat. So that is a bad, that shines a bad light on me. And it turns out he didn't, he just, you know, he got out, he, he got out on bail. Um, but it didn't look good because I was an associate of his, so I had to explain that away. What happened at the party that, what, was it like a faux pas or something? He touched, what, did he touch yeah, him? Yeah, he put his hands put on his someone hand on or something? What, what? He, uh, yeah, so wh when Louis came in the door, um, the story goes, and I got it from, the, you know, it was there. Louis comes in, 10 years is sitting there with a cane, He's an older gentleman now, but he's still that old gangster that he is. And Tinius turns around and pokes him in the belly. And he makes a comment about his weight. And then he makes a comment about Louis's weight, starting to say, he says, you're starting to look like your brother. 
who was extremely overweight. And Louis took offense to that in such a way that he just blew a gasket. And I guess, you know, and in Louis defense, maybe because he was like a nephew to most of these guys and he came up in it and he grew up in a neighborhood. Maybe he thought he could just go and blow off some steam, but he came at him, uh, cursed him out, had a couple of vulgar things to say about people. And then actually made a comment. You better be careful. Cause by this time he already got it. He thinks he got his button. Nobody's acknowledged him as such. And the problem was, he says, you don't even know who you talk to, you know, everything's going to change. You old guys. And he made some really, really derogatory comments and put himself in the jam and uh, that didn't sit well with the old guys, these guys that we're talking about, the, the Charlie Mujeres, the Charlie Stangos, the, the gangsters, gangsters. That didn't sit well with them because... The OGs. The, this yeah, yeah, right. Calicante OGs. Party. This was grandkids, nieces, nephews, wives, cousins. This was a family gathering. And then he's dropping F-bombs and doing what he's doing, making him bar- you know, bringing this to the, to the surface. And it, it didn't go over well. So that was the, that wasn't the reason, no total reason, but it was the beginning of the end for him. It's a big violation of protocol. So is he on the yeah. shelf right now? No, I don't think so. I don't know. I haven't asked, and I haven't. You know, I'm not around it much. I try not to keep tabs on these guys too much. Um, and we, I don't see, know. And all yeah, all, all know. the speculation, and and I know I'm I'm jumping ahead of ourselves, and we'll go right back uh, in a second. But the the belief amongst at least mob watchers is that. Uh, Charlie Big Ears uh, Majory is the boss now. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, he is. Yeah, he is. And uh, mm-hmm. Frank Caracci died and John Rig- Riggy died. I think they died in 16 and 17, maybe 2016, 2017. Right. Um, yeah, uh, Riggy died right after I came out. Uh, and how old is Manny Riggy? I think Manny Reggie, I don't know how old he is, but you know what? He might have passed away as well. I'm not 100% sure on that. But he, he was an older guy because uh, we're not talking about He was about- older, yeah. He was, no, if Louie was in his 40s, Manny was probably in 60s. He was older. Because John Riggy, when he passed, was in his was 90s. Old, he was 91 yeah, yeah, yeah. or better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. then let's talk about uh, just getting in good with, with Charlie the Hat. I mean, you were with him, what, a couple years before, yeah. the, before the bus came down? Yeah. So with Charlie, when I met him at the diner, um, he, you know, he was in my face and, you know, sit next to me, come here and sit here. Uh, and the interaction I had with him that day, he, he, he wanted to meet me. He wanted to put eyes on me. And at the end of the conversation, we had uh, lunch at the union Plaza diner. He did a couple of things that showed me what an animal he truly could be and what a sociopath he could be. And, um, you know, he almost spat, uh, food all over me. He ordered a um, pastrami sandwich and it had too much fat in it, you know, and he's fresh out of the can, this guy, you know, he was held down for a number of years. So he, he had no etiquette and he just, you know, spit the stuff all over. And there's a Gambino associate who he called to this meeting because he wanted that guy to bring me to him and, uh, you know, basically say, look, this guy looked into you, you know, you, whatever you and my nephew were doing, you know, I'll allow it to go on for the time being, but you know, we'll see what happens. I just want to meet you. And then he explained to me, he goes, uh, you know, I'm on parole and uh, I'm not doing anything. You know, I'm sticking, I'm staying clean. Uh, I live in Florida. I'm here in New Jersey, but I'm moving out to Nevada. And me as a, as a law enforcement guy, I'm scratching my head going, wait a minute. You're on parole and you're flying all over this country like you don't care. Right. You know, who's your PO? Like, are you, are you kidding me? So he goes, so I'm moving out to Nevada. Maybe I'll call you. Maybe I won't. We'll see. And that was it. So uh, nice meeting you, Mr. Gatto. Have a nice life. Maybe we'll talk. Maybe we won't. And he went on his merry way and it was a couple of weeks went by and he decided, okay, you know, I'm going to give this guy a call. And then Jimmy called me up one day and said, listen, you know, go buy a burner phone and my uncle wants you to call him on this number. And then from there, it was very slow. It was like a dating relationship and getting to know you. And uh, once he he felt he could trust me, everything was great. And then one night he had a, a nightmare. I write about in the book, he had a nightmare. Out of the blue, everything was going great. We were getting to know you kind of phase and he left me a message, whatever you and my nephew were doing, it's illegal. I don't want ever want you to call me back. I want nothing to do with it. And do yourself a favor, kid. Don't ever call me back. I got that loud and clear. I speak Jersey. You know, <laughs> right. don't ever call me back. And uh, That's a that threat. was it. That's you know, a that, threat. For yeah, people that don't it's speak a, Jersey, then... <laughs> That's a wrap, you know, either it's a wrap or if you call, you're going to be wrapped up in a rug. So, uh, <laughs> it's a wrap case over and, uh, 
you know, but I, I knew there was something in my gut. And again, that you follow your gut with everything I did in law enforcement. And, um, and I said, nah, you know, listen, let's just find out what happened here. So Anthony Zamponi, my supervisor was the one, he stepped up and he went to battle for me all the way down to headquarters in Washington and they, all the way to the Hoover building. He fought tooth and nail because he knew, see, again, the stars aligned for me because I had a guy who was a subject matter expert on his family, who knew them in and out, who was now my supervisor on his case. So I was blessed to have this guy and he fought to keep me alive in his case. And then it was, all right, listen, we'll agree to send you. He want, Charlie wanted me to come out to Vegas. And they were like, you crazy? There's no way we're sending an FBI on the cover to Vegas. You, you wind up in the desert buried somewhere. We'll never find you. And uh, I'm not, let me, I want to go. I really want to go. So we came up with a way and we, we mitigated it. And he came out and it was uh, the Kentucky Derby. And I got a cabana at the hotel I was staying in. He came over and I had this great asset. And, you know, he, he came over and, and he went swimming with me and spent the day in a cabana watching the Kentucky Derby. And, um, you know, everything was great. And it wasn't, he was very comfortable because he watched me go swimming in the pool. And after I knew it, he wasn't saying anything to me. He, he insisted that he wanted to talk to me about some things. And uh, once I went swimming and he felt comfortable to talk to me, he was like, all right, now come over here, sit next to me. And I sat so close to each other. We were almost sitting on each other's laps. And, uh, you know, that 100 degree Vegas weather with the sun beating off all these hotels, uh, you, we were roasting like ants under a magnifying glass. And, and he was just spewing it all out. All right, this is how it works. This is who I am. This is how, this is what you're going to do when you go back home. Your life is going to change. You're with us now. You're going to fly the flag. This is what it means to fly my flag. And then we'll see where it goes from there and we'll make our way in. And then that changed our relationship from that point on. Uh, he watched me every day. He watched me from the phones. He watched me from checking in. He watched me with the Gambinos. He watched me with his nephew. He watched me with everybody. And then uh, he kept tabs on me. And then eventually he knew I was running around like crazy. He was putting me into other Borgatas. Then he would call me up and say, go see this guy from the Columbus. Go see this guy from Gambinos. Go see this guy from this family. And then he was putting me into meetings. And if I had stuff in the street and we were doing deals, we were doing it together or I was just meeting people. And because I was doing things and representing them, he would then get feedback from those people or from his Gambinos. Because again, the Decapacentes, they really fly the flag under the, the Gambinos. They're the big brother. And uh, so Charlie was reporting right back to and had the, the, the boss, the Gambino, New Jersey boss, reporting right back to Umami. So he was getting great intel from a guy who was his Gumbada forever. And that's how he was getting. And then he, he really came to trust me. And then it was a regular basis, come out again. Then it was a little more and a little more and a little more to the point where uh, he basically said, OK, that's it. You're with me. And then again, here comes Louie. You know, one day I got a call from Louie and he's trying to get in touch with me and I'm putting him on a back burner. Uh, and I knew that he had gotten this so-called button of his. I, I heard rumors from it. Charlie didn't confirm, but I knew from the intel side of law enforcement. And, uh, you know, I got to watch that balance of what I say. Because uh, that's, that's, that could be poisonous. You can accidentally slip and say something and then guys will be like, how did you know he got made? You know, so you really got to watch what you're saying. You know, if you go out and you have a couple, couple too many drinks, you know, something happens and you have a slip of the tongue, you know, it's a slippery slope. Don't ever think that the mafia is not what it used to be. It's still there. As strong as it ever was, they might not be up in your face, but, you know, they still have old school values and the old school gangsters that are there. The young guys coming up might be different, but these old school guys, they don't change. I know from I know from my reporting on um, the Bruno Scarfo family in Philadelphia, uh, I wrote the autobiography of Crazy Phil Leonetti, who was Nicky Scarfo's nephew and uh, underboss and was running Atlantic City in the 80s. And uh, what you just said, though, made me think of an anecdote that he had said to me where, you know, Nicky Scarfo look, looked for ways to trip up his own guys by liquoring them up and trying to get yeah. their guard down. And he would pretend like he was drinking alongside them. But in reality, he had told the bartender or the or the waitress to be sure to just be giving him water when he's giving everyone else Cuddy Sark. And yeah. he's let, and it feels like, yeah, a couple guys ended up dead because of my uncle getting them drunk and having them kind of go <laughs> off at the go off at the mouth at a, at a at a restaurant when they would have never said any of that if my uncle hadn't been just, you know, pouring liquor down their throat. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and you know it, it's they, they, they'll do it. They'll bet you out. They're not stupid people by any means. So talk about the 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 final couple nails in the coffin for for Charlie the Hat and how how that bus ended up coming down in fifteen. 
So uh, what really happened was um, when I came home one time from Vegas, Louie called me up and he was trying to get a meeting with me. So what happened was he couldn't get a hold of me because I was kind of blowing him off a little bit and just, you know, now I'm with Charlie. So I wasn't being cocky about it. I was just trying to distance myself from him. And, um, you know, he kept hounding me and hounding me. So one of my associates, he reached out to him. And this associate who was in the street with me, he was like, look, this guy, Louie, keeps calling me. He wants to see you. I don't know what the hell he wants, but he wants a meeting with you. All right, well, tell him I'll meet him tomorrow. Set the meeting up. And I go and I, boom, I set it up. Not that I'm somebody of that importance, but I was just like, you know, I really don't want to do anything. The bureau doesn't want me to. All right, I'll take the meeting with him. When I go to this meeting, his whole persona had changed because in his mind, he was a made guy now. And he turns around, he wanted to win me. So Louie turns around, he says, where have you been? Don't worry about where I've been. And again, here comes the biker out of me. Not the gangster, but the biker. Don't worry about where I've been. Don't ask me my business. Don't ever, ever ask me my business. That could be, I'll never talk to you again. It's none of your business. Don't worry about what I do unless it's something we're doing together. And I was real cocky about it. So I took that stance with him. And he goes, nah, nah, I just want to know. Because like, you know, a lot of things are coming up in my brain. Like, you know, you walk like me, you talk like me. You know, we're close to close in age. Like, where do you come from? So that's when I shared with him my biker persona. And I said, look, this is who I am. This is how I came up. This is all new to me. That my Italian heritage is my heritage. But, you know, I, I didn't grow up the way you grew up, Lou. I didn't grow up in this life. I'm learning as I go, but I'm a street guy. And I'm a gang, you know, I, I'm a street gangster. I could be a gangster. But if you're asking me who I'm with and you keep breaking my horns, I'll tell you who I'm with. All right. I'm a lone wolf and I do have a lone wolf tattoo on my body because when I was a kid, that's the reason why I got it. I'm a one man gang. That's how I used to think of myself when I was a stupid 16 year old kid. So I pulled up my sleeve and I see that. That's why. I'm like, well, don't worry about me. But if you to answer your question, if I need an army, I'll call an army. And they will come riding in here on our iron horses, and I'll mow your little city down. And because I came off that way, he got a little cocky with me. Uh, and he goes, listen, I'm only trying to say, you know, you got to be careful with Charlie. You want to be with Charlie, you know, you've been out in Vegas. All right, so you know I've been out in Vegas. Let's get down to it. What do you want? Well, you should be with me. Well, you know, my FBI supervisors tell me I should be with Charlie Stango. So that's where I'm going to go. So uh, that rubbed him the wrong way. And I said, nah, you know, I'm going to be with Charlie. I respect Charlie. We get along. No offense, Lou. We could always do business together. And let's, we're going to have to be in the same Borgata together. So let's try to get along. We're different crews, but, you know, let's try to get along. And he kind of left it alone for a while. But what happened was Charlie came to New Jersey because he went on a record with me. He wanted me to be introduced to the bosses in the administration. And the day he did that, um, after we did that, it was, it was at a particular pork store and a, and a butcher shop that mimics the one in the Sopranos. It was just like going to Satriots, the little table outside. And Charlie was waiting for me. The bosses had come. Everybody was all dressed up inside this little deli and butcher shop. And, you know, they're dressed to the nines and the boss comes, the, the underboss, the street boss came and I went on record with him and a consigliere and, and Charlie was feeling his oats. So Louie wasn't there but he made it a point to drive through the neighborhood and Charlie wanted me to drive around in my Cadillac Escalade and he, he just kept pointing out. So you see this place over here, this is owned by a guy like me. See this place over here, it's owned by a guy like you. You know, this is who we are, this is how we live. Don't come down here, it gets hot down here. So he's giving me the lessons. And then what happened was he drove me right to Luigi Oliveri's house. So really what he was doing was he just wanted to piss all over him. And he made it a point to, to get out of the car and say, I'll be right. He never told me where he was going. He said, I'll be right back. And then uh, about 15, 20 minutes went by and, and Charlie was gone. I didn't know where the hell he was. And then Charlie didn't show back up. Louie did. And when Luigi showed up, I was like, well, where's Charlie? Don't worry about it. Come here. And he made me come out and do a walk and talk with him. And then right out of the gate, he said to me, the way you talked to me that day, and I was very respectful of him because I knew at that point he was a made guy. And again, I knew my line and I knew where I, I couldn't, I couldn't never be aggressive towards a made guy. That'll get you whacked out in that life. You touch a made guy, it's a, it's an order for death. And, uh, I had to bow down and I kissed him and I gave him a kiss on each cheek as you do with a made guy. And I said, Hey, congratulations. I hear congratulations or an order. I'm sorry. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. Well, you know what? You ought to be careful who you're talking to before, you know, find out who you're talking to now. So he played the part a little bit. And then he threatened to chop me up into pieces. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a moment. And um, before you know it, his crew started coming all out. And I thought for a minute there, they were going to drag me into the basement because I knew his history. I knew he collects money. I knew how he collects with pit bulls. And I knew all of this. And I could hear the dogs barking in the background of his building. And uh, 
before you know it, the conversation went, uh, you know, listen, the day I met you when you were associate and you told me you were going to be with Charlie, he fessed up to me that um, there was surveillance on me that day. And he followed the car and he made me, he said, guess where we followed the car back to? I said, I have no idea. Why don't you tell me? We were going to play games here. He said, go ahead, guess. Guess where I followed him to? I have no idea. FBI building. So they wound up following one of the FBI agents back to the FBI building in Newark after my meeting. So that caused a little bit of grief. I got through that. I explained in the book how we kind of got through it. Charlie showed back up. Uh, you know, and again, do I tell Charlie? Do I not tell Charlie? I chose to tell Charlie about the FBI agent getting followed because I realized what if he told him on a walk and talk, which most likely he did. And if I don't fess up to it and Charlie knows about it, Charlie's going to fester and he's going to fester. Why isn't, why isn't Giovanni telling me this? Why is he hiding it from me? So I came out and told him. And then that's when Charlie, he confided in me, says, listen to me, don't worry about it. That kid's wearing a hat that don't fit his head. Just stay in your lane and we're going to take care of it. By that point, the whole thing with 10 years happened and all of this stuff happened in the family. They were already in the, the wheels were in motion to take this guy out. And I didn't know that at the time. So fast forward a few months, um, Charlie came back to me and they decided, I guess, through conversation that they were going to, they were going to whack this guy out. And, uh, Charlie tasked me with it and he says, you know, and you're going to do it, you know? And after we went through this lengthy explanation on why they were going to whack him out. And I said, ah, you know, okay. He goes, and, uh, you're going to do it. And I was like, me, what? I, what? Cause actually what he said to me is the administration saying is not a problem. We don't have a problem. We got to have a problem. So what Charlie did was he made a problem. He made me the problem. And he said to me, you know, you're the problem. And again, when you're with the sociopath and he tells you the problem, I, I freaked out. So you're talking about on the problem. No, listen to me, boy, my boy, you are the problem. We're going to make you the problem. And that's it. We're going to take this guy out and you're going to do it. And when I questioned him on, I was like, all right, well, you want me to do it? Are they offering your button for, for doing this? Are they saying, no, no, that didn't come till later. That conversation didn't come till later. Again, here's my capo. And by now I'm, I'm running hard with him and I'm representing him. I'm now speaking at this point in the, in the case, I'm speaking for Charlie. He's sending me somewhere on behalf of him. Not only was I flying the flag, but I was going to meetings and speaking for him. I was his voice, you know, and he made that very clear when the day we went on record with me, not that I, I became a May guy in any way, shape or form the day in that butcher store, he told the bosses, that's it. I'm going to be out in Vegas. Giovanni speaks for me and everything's going to happen here. And so much to the point where the boss, the, the street boss had turned around and said, all right, listen, if this is the way it's going to be, here's my direct number. If you have any problems, you reach out to me directly, you know? So I had that kind of juice through Charlie. Um, and then, you know, he just decided that I was going to do this thing and I wasn't going to question him. And uh, I guess I realized real quick that the case was going to come to an abrupt end because we don't kill people, you know. Um, and there was a couple other people on a plate at the time. Uh, Louis was not the only one initially. And then some came, you know, they, the rest of them were taken off the plate. There was, there was supposed to be a couple of hits. And uh, Louis was the, the only one left standing. And then Charlie said to me, be the man you were born to be, be the man I'm teaching you how to be, and you're going to do this. So he came up with the idea with a little push from me. Uh, I should use your out. You should use your outlaw friends. Cause he met two of my outlaw biker buddies that are like my family. And I had a whole legend to go with it. And he met them. My, my buddy Dutch, uh, who was like a brother to me and he was another undercover. And you know, I, we just synced up perfectly and he met Charlie out in Vegas. Charlie had met him prior to that on another deal that we were doing. And he came up with the idea. He's like, well, you, you need people. And by this time, Charlie was building a crew for me and I was running his crew. He had people reporting to me on a daily basis by this point, his son being one of them. He put his son under me. His son, Anthony was on probation at the time. And, and he called me up one day and I got a, I got the kid a job driving a dump truck. And then eventually Charlie called me up and said, all right, that's it. I'm going to put, you know, my son's going to be under you. He's going to report to you every day. So just a little more pressure on me. I would tell people to to Google Anthony Stango. They called him Whitey. He <laughs> definitely yeah. looks like what you would what you might think a modern day wannabe <laughs> wise guy would look like in 2021. He doesn't fit the stereotypical uh, no. wise guy look. He looks more of like a, a teenager on his way to a uh, a Jay Z concert. 
Um, he does, yeah. <laughs> but he had a lot of ties in the street. Yeah. He did. He had a lot of ties in the street, and don't get, don't, don't let the look fool you because he was a capable kid. If he had to be a shooter, I believe that you know, if if he hadn't in the past, he he had a he had a temper on him, you know, and it came to the point where we were later in the, our ba- our crews were doing battle. Our crew with with Charlie and me and me and Charlie's crew, as I call it, and then my guys were coming to me and saying, listen, we're getting texts from Louis guys. We got to, we got to, we got to, we got to strike. We got to go at them. We got to go at them. Let's go at them. Let's go do it right now. Let's do it now. We got to do it. We got to, you know, and everything was, we got to do it for daddy, you know? And then it was like, no, you don't do anything unless I tell you to do something. And I'm told by him, our skipper tells us what to do, you know? And you don't do anything until I do. But this kid had a hair trigger just like his old man. Cause he grew up watching Charlie's craziness, you know? Um, so he was a capable kid. So I was controlling both Stangos in my life. Um, but I did have a great relationship with a love relationship with Whitey. I, gre- I, I grew to know him and I grew to know his family. And, um, you know, I, I knew them. I knew them in and out. And I made sure he was, he was a good father. You know, he tried. He didn't have it all. And he had a bad, bad rap growing up and stuff. But he tried to be the best father he could. You know, uh, he was a good kid. But... He could be a gangster's gangster. I took meetings. I would go with Anthony and pay other uh, capos. You know, we did deals with other crews. Anthony would come with me because I insisted that I would be the one to pay the captains. You know, and within our family, it would come from me. And then, you know, that's how I knew how serious the war was when I had gone to another captain. He's now deceased. But when I went to his, he was on parole for murder and he wanted to kill Jimmy Smalls. And he said, look, and by that point, this captain is talking to me like I'm Charlie's son and I'm with Whitey. And he's saying, look, Giovanni, I know your father a long time referring to Charlie. He said, but I, I tell you right now, go tell your father. I love him. But that kid, Jimmy, if I see him, he's gone. They want to kill him. He says that the minimum he's going to the hospital, but I'm going to kill the kid. You know, so you had all these things and all these conversations that I had to report back to Charlie. And then, you know, Charlie would tell me, bring a message back and tell him this, tell him that. So meanwhile, the the murder was being planned. Charlie was getting anxious and, you know, uh, it took us a while. I wanted to make sure all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And it took a while to get all the evidence packed and, and for the prosecution to get their case together for a takedown. And I bought them about four more months or so just by saying, listen, I'm not going to use guys in my crew. Charlie didn't want me to use his son to do his deed. And I said, I'm using these guys and I got to use guys I trust. And I got Dutch, who's my best friend who I I ride and die with. But the other shooter, the guy that I'm going to use, he's on parole. He's going to be off in two more months. And let this guy come down here and get pinched for breaking his parole while he's doing surveillance on this this social club. So give me a couple of months. And I did, they bought it and I I bought uh, some time and you know, they, they let me, but Charlie was getting so anxious at the end. He was like, look, you got to kill this kid. You got to kill him, kill him, kill him. Just maim him, run him over, throw acid in his face, run him over and put him in a wheelchair for the rest of the life. You got to kill this kid. You know, he was getting anxious and more anxious. I thought so much so that he was going to come in and do it himself. So, you know, things had to be rushed up a little bit. And uh, that was it. He would have had that sanctioned by the administration, right? He he didn't. He couldn't just order a guy executed, right? No, no. All this went to the administration. So, you know, for time purposes, I know you guys are, but yeah, this was all bounced off the administration. Charlie would go have a phone call. So by that point we were up on wiretaps and stuff like that towards the end of the case. So we were getting a lot of this on firsthand, you know, listening. And, um, Charlie would then call the administration or he came in and had a meeting with them and basically told them, you know, and the best conversation we ever heard was the one where he told the administration, you know, of course he had the phone passed off to two other guys and eventually he got the street boss on the phone and he, he explained to them, listen, it's a done deal. These guys are coming in. And he referred to them. He says, they're like angels from hell. <laughs> That's what he's trying to relate to them, who they were. Right. And he said, they're going to come in and they're going to do this thing. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, it was all sanctioned and it was all run up the chain and they were all, we didn't do anything you know, off the, off the cuff. But by then to answer your question before, I wasn't offered a button until later uh, when I, when I challenged Charlie and, and rightfully so I said, Charlie, listen, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this deed, right? I'm doing this for you, Skip, and I'm doing it for us. But you know, how does this leave me? I mean, what do you mean? And these are conversations I'd have in his house is, well, 
I do this. There's going to be people coming at me. We're at war. We're at borderline war with each other right now in the family. Like, you know, there's two divisions. There's two different sides. And like, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah, but these guys are going to come at me. And he would laugh. He'd laugh it off. He says, listen, my boy, don't you worry about it. There's going to be 50 guys standing in a line waiting to pin the medals on your chest. Don't worry about it. You know, just be the man you were born to be. All right. I said, and, and then again, I, I used to have these conversations because from an investigator's point of view, you don't want to just have one conversation and have some defense attorney beat it up. So I would always revisit it. And again, I had that relationship, that father son relationship with Charlie where he wasn't looking at me sideways anymore. You know, by that point it was, why are you staying on the strip? Come stay at the house. I got extra bedrooms. You know, I love you. Be careful. Call me when you land, you know, and it wasn't because he thought I was get pinched. It was because he genuinely cared for me, you know? And, um, and then towards the end, I, I challenged him again and he turned the TV up as loud as he could in the house. And he only did motions with his hands and, uh, he laughed at me. I said, you know, listen, Skip, I understand what you're asking me to do. And I got to say it one more time. We're getting close here. It's going to happen. They put this guy down. I went through this whole story about, you know, we went, we've been doing surveillance on him and he go, I said, you know, we're not sure the biker guys don't know which one it is that came out of the club. And he said, he, he went and got me pictures of Louie. He says he printed pictures off his, off his computer and said, hey, give, the, give him these pictures. This will help them. And then I, I challenged him and said, okay, well, where does this leave me at the end? And he pointed to himself and he goes, and he pointed to his chest and he points to the sky. And I said, what are you talking about? And then I played stupid. And I know he has such a short temper that I make him talk. And eventually he goes, no, Jesus Christ, this kid, listen to me. Because I was like, I don't understand what you're saying. You're doing sign language. I don't get it. What are you saying? Listen to me, Jesus Christ. Me, I'm going up. I'm getting up. So he was trying to tell me he was going to, after all this was done and the dust settles, he was going to be made possibly the number two, which was the street boss, the underboss. And then he would become underboss. And I said, really? That's great. Congratulations. That's all good. No, nah, I'm not done. And he pointed to me and he said, you, you go up. And then that's what he said, explain to me on tape. He goes, you know, then you go up. You're going to get up. I'm going to get up. He says, yeah. And remember, I come off parole. He, he would have been off parole. He explained to me when he gets off parole, he was going to get up. Then, and I would get up after everything. He says, so don't worry about it. Just do what you got to do. So, and then the last day I was with the man, he was jumping for joy. I want to be there with you. I want to be there. Not, not knowing that the whole thing was right. coming, crashing down, and that he was eventually going to be in Yeah. Handcuffs yeah. before yeah. before long. Can you also share with us, uh, share with our audience, the um, as you're in the middle of this operation, you're actually not living far from the center of mafia activity and the precarious position you were in. Didn't you run yeah. into a, a, an associate or a made guy or an associate at like a uh, little league game or and something fr- like and that? And frankly, Giovanni, before you answer this, I, I just wanted to you know give a little editorialization here. It seems like there was a real logistical blind spot in the way that the higher ups here put this all together. I mean, and and it seems like that blind spot could have really put you and your family's life in danger in terms of how how to I guess draw down or or pull you out of of uh, your undercover work and then putting you in a neighborhood where all the people that you went under cover uh, against we're living. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we got, you know, and again, it's not to defend them. I think we all got poisoned by it. You know, here we are. It's the likes of since Jack Garcia did his thing, you know, um, there's nobody that's infiltrated to this level that I was at, you know, and then of course the ultimate, um, the ultimate medal of honor for them is, is for the, any law enforcement is to any undercover to get, become a made guy to get made. Right. That's what they would love to do. And I guess after the, my predecessors and, and, and Jack came pretty damn close, um, you know, there hasn't been anybody. And now these guys start looking at it. You know, you understand there's a lot of high fives going on within the bureau. This thing is going all the way down and there were law enforcement leaks along the way here. This case was like, you know, it, it had to be sealed within. It, it was a, it was a real, it was, it was insane what was going on. We had law enforcement leaks, leaking information back to the De Cavacante family that they were being looked at and watched. Not that there was another cover, just that, the, that they were being looked at heavily, heavily. 
And I didn't know where that leak was coming from this whole time. And there's a law enforcement leak that we knew of. Um, there was all these things going on and everybody's high five. And because at this point, and you know, listen, so I sat there with Anthony Zamponi, my, my supervisor. And he's like, this is great. Yeah, this is great. You know, this is tremendous. So we looked at it as a good possibility. The only person that saw it coming was my wife. She warned me when I, when I fessed up, when things got out of hand after the soccer game, she was the one that said to me, you're going to destroy our family. This is not going to end well. Cause she had a, she had experience in law enforcement. She was law enforcement. She worked undercover herself. And she said, this is a bad thing. This is going to end bad for us. You're going to destroy our family. And I was like, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. This is super sexy. This is awesome. This is great. You know, I got lost in it. And that was my, my addiction. My, my addiction was that adrenaline and that, you know, that, that desire to succeed in every case I ever did. How did you explain your way out of that situation at the soccer game where a, a mafia guy sees you and he's like, Hey, what are you doing here? Yeah. So I bought myself some time. Uh, again, by this point I was trying not to live in a different places. I had, I had a house, I had an apartment in New York and I was out in Vegas a lot at that point, And I was living out that way and just spending a lot of time away from my family. And I wanted some downtime. I needed some downtime. And I took a, I took a blow. I told, I told guys in my crew, you know, listen, I got to have a little bit of a break. She's riding me. You know, they knew I had a girlfriend and I, you know, I got to get away for a little bit and I, I'm, I'm going away for a couple of days. And I was with my real family and here I am, I'm being myself and I'm Giovanni Rocco and I'm, I got my shorts. I got my flip flops. I'm enjoying a, a soccer tournament. It's, it's, these tournaments are, are huge. Hundreds of teams, thousands of people. And it's, you know, and I think it was in like Monroe, New Jersey. And there's just a sea of cars and a sea of teams and people and families. And he, my daughter was in between games and we were having lunch. My, my folks, my parents had been there and uh, they were visiting us and they were able to make it to my, my daughter's first tournament and they were there to enjoy it. And here we are sitting between games, having some lunch and sitting in these lawn chairs and by the parking lot. And before you know it, here comes this Gambino, you know, walking towards me. And it was the guy that vetted me. You know, and it, and he comes walking towards me, and as I see him, he's on his phone, and I thought, you know, I got paranoia set in right away. Oh my God, there's Gooms. You know, Gooms sees me. Gooms just look. I think he just looked up at me. That's Gooms. He's 50 yards away. He's 40 yards away. He's walking right towards me, and I just got up, got out of my chair, didn't say a word. Thank God, my wife and I had, you know, we always planned for these things. God forbid, us both being in law enforcement, and I flanked him, and I came at him from his left and I go, Hey, Hey Gomes. And he whipped around and sees me and I came in for the two kisses Wow! and he just finger in my chest and pushed me straight back. What are you doing? What are you doing here? Giovanni, Giovanni, what are you doing? It's nothing. Come here. Give me a hug. Give me a kiss. What are you talking about? We meet four days a week for coffee and we, you know, we, it's me. Now what are you doing here? And I, I saw this darkness. Then I realized what this guy was capable of. And he just oh, shit. stone cold, what are you doing? Are you following me? Are you following me? And then it was like, no, we talking about following you. And I just pulled this story and I explained the book. I pulled this crazy story, which you always had to be prepared. And you know, you're kind of trained to do it. And I came up with a story that he bit. And I came up with a story that, nah, listen, he goes, you don't have kids. Why are you here at a soccer tournament? This don't make sense. You don't even live in here. You don't, you live in New York city. What are you doing here? So I quickly went, nah, listen, I'm here for this girl. I used to date this girl. You know, I told you about this girl, a little kid. Her father's being held down right now. And, and I came up with a story and I said, you know, I taught the girl how to play soccer. And I promised her if she ever, you know, took up travel soccer, I would come to a big and she called me the other day and, you know, the old man's held down. So what am I going to do? I stepped in and I quickly changed it. Thank God, Mano, you do this every week. What are you doing? This is crazy. You, you come to this thing every week like this, Gooms. This is insane. Look at all these cars. Look at all these people. This is, no wonder why you're never around on the weekends. Ah, forget about it. He bought. He bet. Forget about it. You know what, Giovanni? You don't even know. I said, my God, Gooms, this is crazy. And then I quickly changed the subject. And he was like, ah, forget it. This is crazy. But anyway, here she is. And I see his daughter. Hey. And she comes running up to me, hug. And because I knew. Her, and, and he says, uh, so what are you doing? I said, nah, I'm done. I said, they, they, they lost their first game. They're out of this thing. I drove all the way in here. They lose their first game. I'm gone. He goes, oh, forget about it. She's oh, playing shit. this other team over here. Guess whose team she's going to play? <laughs> My right. daughter's team. Because it's Murphy's Law, right? 
And uh, I said, all right, Gomes, let me go. I got to get out of here. I got to go find my... It's going to take me an hour to find my car. I'm still making jokes. It's going to take me an hour and a half to find my car. Jesus. Yeah, forget about it. Good luck. Where'd you park? I don't know. All the way out nowhere. He says, yeah, I got a good spot right here. And when he points to his $100,000 Mercedes, it's right where I was sitting. I was pretty much sitting on a bumper of his car, and I was so oh, unplugged that my situation went well. I never paid attention to it. And that's why he was walking right towards me. So... I jumped, you know, I started walking on the road and my wife calls me up. She's like, what the, you know, really? And she was in a panic. And I said, nah, just, you know, send my old man to get me. Some, just tell my father to come get me. And of course he came. I'm walking on the side of the road and he comes, pick me up. And I had to fess up to him. He said, what the hell's going on? Like, you know, what are you doing? He had no idea. And I said, just drive me home. He goes, what are you doing? And I came to him. He says, are you out of your mind? You know? So I didn't tell him every little detail, but I kind of shed some light. And, you know, he started looking at me a little differently and, you know, because I went to wear narcotics, he was a, uh, he was a homicide detective and a major case detective. <laughs> he always wanted me to wear a suit, you know, and he always made fun of me for being a narc, but, uh, you know, but then he realized what I was doing. So, you know, but it was little uh, things so, like but, that. And then there was some up, other things up along the way, the case, and, you know, though, that's just uh, one of many. Against, uh, you, but, but you uh Charlie the Hat, right? Case, that's, though, um, Operation Charlie against, the, yeah, uh, right, right. Charlie right. the Hat, right? That's mm-hmm. Operation Charlie Horse. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, opera, that came down. I left Charlie's house and uh, said my goodbyes to him, and he knew that I was going to go home that night. Uh, I got I got word out in Vegas that the the biker guys were uh, they they put him down. They put Louie down somewhere, and I was going back to do it. And he knew that I was going to do it that night, and you know, or the night the night after that when I got home, and he couldn't be more excited. You know, he walked me out to my car like he always did, and you know, I'll take two extra bottles of water. Don't you know it's. It's very dry out here. Stay, stay hydrated. Be careful. Call me when you get home. It's all right. You know, this is a good thing. Oh, this is great. So we had, we took a ride on a strip in my, my car out there and uh, in my Cadillac out there, the sedan. And he, he basically told me, look, you know, if he's in the coffee shop, no, just walk in, boom, boom, and walk out. You know, if, if he's there and a lot of people there, just, you know, unless, unless you want to get a, he was telling me, unless I want to get military grade explosives and blow the whole place up. <laughs> Jesus, it's always an option. <laughs> you know? you keep, you well, keep, that, and that's how you he did You got to cover it. all your bases. <laughs> Very matter of fact, unless whatever you want to do, G. Vine, unless you want to do it, you want to blow up your stuff and throw one of them things in there and kill everybody. But we had conversations. I'd be like, well, what if anybody gets up? You know, if anybody gets up, you know, shoot them in the leg, make, send a message and just tell them to sit down. You know? Well, this was uh, quite a uh, conversation, an interview. <laughs> you've done it all. You've said it all. Uh, you've literally lived a movie script. We've had a number of of people that have lived a movie script on this uh, on this podcast. But you're definitely at the at the top of that chart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we got we have price. to get you back on here because there's still a lot that we didn't get to, but we just run out you, of time. But we got to have fa- you back on. You've done f- over 50 uh, episodes here in the last couple of years. This has got to be one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, it definitely makes my top five. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to hear that. Thank you. You are, uh, you, you've lived a noble life, my friend, and, uh, you, you, you should wear that, uh, that badge with honor. I mean, I know you don't wear a badge everywhere you go now, but just know that, uh, there's police work and then there's police work. Um, and yeah. I'm not trying to disparage people that, that, uh, you know, work the beat for a living or, 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 or cut parking tickets, but, uh, the type of work that you do and you did and, and people of your ilk, um, you really don't get to do that, that you deserve because it's, you know, it's just as dangerous as, as being on the front line of a, of a war, uh, overseas and and you're doing it uh, without blinking an eye, and and I, I give my gratitude, and and uh, just want you to know what what a superstar you are in in the eyes of the OG podcast. I appreciate that very much, and you know it, it, it is the guys and girls on the front line of uh, being law enforcement. They're the ones that you know they're putting their neck out every single day, and you know we didn't even get into the mental health end of it, but you know it's taking its toll on me just like it does every first responder and. You know, there's guys and girls that are doing this every single day out there. And there's still undercovers out there that do it. That's kind of the reason why I wrote the book. I wanted people to know that this kind of work is going on every day. And there's men and women out there on the front line every single day doing this. I'm just one of many. I can't imagine the emotional landmines that you had to navigate um, in your work. I mean, obviously in your whole career, but definitely um, in, in the in the case that, that we've just been talking about, Operation... Um, 
Charlie Horse. And, and uh, last thing I'll ask you is, obviously, I'm guessing you've seen the Donnie Brasco movie. And I, I really, I, I've always said, I think that's one of the most, I, I've never been an a undercover law enforcement agent, but in terms of the, the way they tell the story of, of Lefty Guns and how he is just really a spoke on a wheel and they don't really glamorize um, the life, whether it be the life of the gangster, uh, Lefty Guns, or the life of the undercover agent, the, the Joe Pistone character. And there's a scene where he's in um, marriage therapy and mm. he, you, you can see that he's his personality, his, his, um, he, the way he's, his composure, his, everything has changed. And I remember she said something like, "I thought I, I married a college guy, and now you're a yeah. you're a knuckle dragger." And it's yeah. like he's like, "You don't understand. If I if I if I l- let go of this persona, I'm I'm putting everyone at danger. I ha- I have to wear this." veil uh in order for for safety for all of us and it's like this i can't imagine the mental gymnastics that you have to do do with yourself so i guess my question is did you see that did that resonate at all that those those scenes in donnie brasco very much so i think every undercover goes through when you're working deep cover um i think for joe and myself and the other guys that have done long term like this and jack garcia you know you, you look at jack garcia when when his guys had hit somebody over the head in, in a Bloomingdale's in a mall and they just start, you know, they have a propensity for violence. And I think that's the common denominator with the three of us and, and what we did in Cosa Nostra. These guys are a hair trigger. You, you know, you talked about it earlier with Nikki Scarfo. Like, you know, there's stories that go back to guys just, you know, from what I heard in stories over the years from, you know, my father-in-law who was, who worked those cases, um, Nikki Scarfo was one of his targets. Now, Nikki, supposedly it, there's a story he killed a guy because somebody in his crew was sneezing too much at dinner <laughs> and the guy turned around he says i can't have this he says, look at this guy down the end of the table he's just sneezing well, hey, hey skip he's got allergies i can't have it it don't look good and that night the guy was gone you know so when you live in that kind of life yeah it takes a toll on you i named the uh, giovanni's ring from pinky ring yeah i i grew up wearing a pinky ring and i have a ring and but the one that I wore from the government, I used as a switch, not to go into too, too deep of a story, but that's where the, the title comes from. My crime ring that I was running for on behalf of Charlie, but then it's also the ring that I wore. It was my mental switch. And I would pull up in my driveway every day when I got home and I would take that ring off. And that was me. It was self-taught. Nobody taught me that. And I took it off and I would leave it in my cup holder in my car. I said, right, now I got to leave this piece of trash, Giovanni Gatto out in my driveway because I would never let a guy like Giovanni Gatto in my house. Now I got to be Giovanni Rocco. And I thought I had it all. I had the, this is balanced. I watched Joe's story. Yeah. You know, I watched him go, that ain't me. That's not me. I got this, I got this all balanced out. I'm a professional. And here I was, it wasn't until one time my son, my little guy was at a reading class uh, after school and he was in one of these little reading clubs. And when you, you, the little kids, I don't know how old he was. He was small. If you read the story or you read the line, correctly you went to the prize box and my little guy being this little italian kid he was going to the prize box he wasn't taking the footballs and the baseballs and the squishy balls he was taking the little girl's gold rings and he started putting them on his fingers and he was emulating giovanni gatto so that's when i realized holy good god this guy's in my house already you know here i was thinking he wasn't in there and he's in my house the whole time you know i i I let my son be exposed to a guy i would never let him be around so you become so blind to it because of that reason. It's a defense mechanism, exactly what you described. The reason why Joe, you know, part of me, I would never say it, but in the end, when Charlie put his hand on the back of my neck, like my uncles have done in the past to pat me, you know, that's old school. That's somebody that's in my world in my true life. That that's a, a sign of affection. It's what I do to my son. Now you, you put your hand on the neck and you tell him what you mean. And Charlie did that to me. I was broke down the night I left. But then he always did something to remind me. Yeah, I wish I could be there to kill this guy with you. <laughs> you know, but I love you. I love you. Be careful going home. So it was those little things that, that set me back to to zero. But yeah, there's plenty of, uh, we could talk about it on the next time. Yeah, but it's a fascinating story and we appreciate you coming on and, and hopefully you'll come back again and join us. Please, uh, audience, go out and buy Giovanni's Ring, My Life Inside the Real Sopranos by Giovanni... Uh, Rocco and uh, listen to the original Gangsters podcast please follow us on social media Facebook Twitter 
um, Instagram and uh, shameless self promotion, Jack Garcia. We've also had him on our show before, so dig into the archives. Uh, we've had other undercover agents. But Giovanni, uh, thank you very much, and please uh, join the uh, Original Gangsters podcast again. A lot more to talk to. I look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Okay, take care. Thanks, Giovanni. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato and my co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. See you next time.